what's going on guys your boy terry by reacts here and i'm back with some more reactions taking a look at some i'm gonna try to knock out as much theory videos as possible um but first let me apologize for the noise you might hear um in the background of these of these videos because i'm trying to get these out today and with no delay um, for some reason, um, we have scheduled the roof to be worked on today. So, a lot of noise. You're going to hear some booms and some stuff like that in the background. Never mind it. It's not continuous. So, you don't have to worry. So, they're pounding on the roof. And you might hear those noises in the background. So, it's not that big a deal. They don't come through. I'm pretty sure it's not going to come. I'm going to listen to the audio after to make sure that it's not as if it's bad, then I won't post it. But if it is, um, but if it's not, I mean, then definitely we go up. Regardless, it's going to go up, man. Y'all can deal with a little pounding in the background. Um, I've seen I've, people on my channel have dealt with worse because I've had some really bad audio um, due to feedback. And you guys have still supported those videos. So a little boom in the background shouldn't bother you guys that much. Okay, so not taking advantage of you guys. As I said, this is, I'm just apologizing in advance just in case it gets really bad. They're not using power tools or anything like that. They're just pounding on the roof right now. So if it gets bad, then I'll pause the video and make sure that it's not in it. But these theory videos, I want to get them out today. Also, also want to do a reaction, get that second episode of Peaky Blinders out. Okay, so just stay tuned. We're here for these theories. Okay, so this first one that I'm going to react to is called Will John Kill Daenerys in Season 8, which obviously I don't believe. I don't think that's going to happen. There's no reason for that to happen. Um, so this theory, I'm definitely interested to, to hear what this guy has to say about this and why he thinks that this is going to happen. Um, it's cause that's as far away from my mind as, as anything can ever possibly be. So to see this, that's why I'm doing it first, but let's see how it goes. Let's jump into it and see how it goes there's some other things i want to address too but i don't want to go any longer so let's just jump into this video and let's go One of the main attractions of the Game of Thrones television series and novels are their incredible battle sequences. Whether the battles are experienced visually or verbally, their epicness cannot be denied. As the show has grown in popularity, the battles have become more expensive and subsequently more impressive. And in this moment of time, Game of Thrones is like a forest fire, a glorious, destructive, beautiful beast burning down everything in its path. But as with all great fires, it began with a spark. And that initial spark was story and characters. What makes the Song of Ice and Fire so attractive is the relationships between its main characters and the emotional impact these relationships have on the audience. Take for example Jon Snow and Arya Stark. These two beloved characters have shared only one scene together in the entire series, just one. Yet when these two long lost siblings finally reunite in season 8, fingers crossed, fans of the show will struggle to hold back their tears. It's also fun to imagine oneself playing the Game of Thrones when our favorite characters succeed, so do we. And when they fail and get their heads chopped off, well... 
then, you know, we're upset. Still not over this. We as human beings are obsessed with the politics of power. I've heard some people make the argument that Game of Thrones is not a fantasy series, but a political drama sprinkled with fantasy elements. Realistically, you can remove every trace of magic in Westeros, and you'd still be left with a fictionalized version of real history, a medieval house of cards. At its core, it's a metaphor and a mirror to society, and one of society's oldest and ugliest flaws is war. Look, society. Look how ugly you are. This anti-war metaphor is mostly served through the War of the Five Kings. This bloody and destructive conflict takes place throughout most of the series and leaves the country of Westeros a ruin. The war creates a power vacuum that leads to a foreign invasion led by Daenerys Targaryen. Daenerys is one of the show's most important characters and her invasion of Westeros has been highly anticipated for seven years. The destruction of King's Landing is shown to Daenerys during her visions in the House of the Undying in Season 2. This season is more drawn out in the Clash of Kings novel where Daenerys sees several more visions and dreams ranging from Robb Stark's death at the Red Wedding and a reality where her son Rhaegar lived and conquered the world. Another key omission from her visions is when Daenerys finds a naked woman lying on the floor. The woman is beaten, battered, and raped by four tiny little men, crawling over her body and fighting for dominion, essentially a metaphor for the War of the Five Kings. These warring families have basically destroyed their country all while ignoring an apocalyptic threat up north. This is a classic anti-war theme, a powerful country disregarding and ignoring their real problems in favor of conquest and domination. Another major anti-war theme found in Game of Thrones is the use of weapons of mass destruction. No matter how cool, no pun intended, the White Walkers are, at the end of the day, they are weapons of mass destruction. They are magical ice demons with the power to kill thousands and then they resurrect those people that they kill. And not only do the White Walkers have the ability for absolute destruction, but in Game of Thrones, the good guys have this power too. Before Daenerys Targaryen brought them back into the world, dragons were legendary figures figures in the world of Westeros. The people of Westeros associate dragons with power and destruction, and whoever controls the dragons usually rules the world. Both of these weapons of mass destruction were on full display in Season 7, even coming head to head. The immovable object finally meets the unstoppable force. Many fans have theorized that Game of Thrones will end with the destruction of both the Night King, his army, and Daenerys' dragons, ushering in a new era in Westeros free of these magical ticking time bombs. And of course, many fans, including myself, have theorized that Jon Snow will be the man to usher in this new era. We've theorized how the first long night was ended by diplomacy instead of fighting, an agreement forged between man and myth that solidified the survival of both. Now that the long night has come again, a new agreement must be made. We've also theorized that Jon Snow is the prince that was promised, the legendary hero prophesied to lead the living against the dead during the long night. When people look back on Game of Thrones, I think season 8 will be considered the definitive season. Up until now, we've basically followed three separate stories. The story of politics, that was led by Tyrion, the story of ice, that was led by Jon, and the story of fire, that was led by Daenerys. Now that these three stories are finally converging, we are starting to see what Game of Thrones truly is at its core, an anti-war story. Now I do think that we will see several epic battles in Season 8. Jon and Daenerys on one side, the Night King on the other side, dragons fighting ice dragons, the living versus the dead, zombie giants and polar bears, possibly ice spiders as big as hounds, dragon glass, valyrian steel, shit is going to go down in Season 8. George R. R. Martin always points to J.R.R. Tolkien as the king of fantasy, and while Game of Thrones is a more complex, morally gray story compared to The Lord of the Rings, I think we will see some of that Tolkien epicness in season 8. There won't be a climactic battle where the good guys defeat the bad guys and everyone rides off into the sunset, but there will be some major action set pieces where all the forces of good and evil, of magic, of ice and fire are just on full display coming head to head. But the true ending of Game of Thrones will be much smaller and more personal. It will involve these characters that we've grown to love and hate, to root for and root against, dealing with their internal conflicts, making decisions against their instincts and desires, eventually sacrificing what they love for the greater good, the bittersweet ending that George R. R. Martin loves to tease. The best way to understand how this Great War will end is going back to the First Great War during the First Long Night. 
We've previously theorized that the first long night was ended by diplomacy instead of war. The first men and the White Walkers came to an agreement, essentially a pact of peace, to divide the continent of Westeros into two regions. The White Walkers would live north of the Wall, and the first men would live south of the Wall. Human sacrifices would be made to the White Walkers to ensure their survival, and no men would be permitted to live north of the Wall. More importantly, we also detailed the rise and fall of the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, better known as the Night's King. Before we get into this, I just want to point out that the Night's King and the Night King are two different characters. The legend of the Night's King is about a man who rose to be the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He eventually deemed himself the Night's King, and he took a female White Walker for his bride. The couple ruled over the Wall from their seat at Nightford, which was the first castle ever constructed on the Wall. Legend states that the Night's King and his bride made human sacrifices and ruled over the Wall with absolute impunity. He was eventually killed when the King of Winter, Brandon the Breaker, and Joramin, the King Beyond the Wall, joined forces and disposed of the Night's King and his bride. Like most legends in Game of Thrones, the legend of the Night's King was probably misconstrued throughout the centuries following his death. It's like a game of telephone. These legends and prophecies can't be taken at face value. George R. R. Martin has said this several times, these legends are passed down by generation, not by text, and even the textual evidence cannot be fully believed. It is more likely that the Night's King was a major player during the First Long Night, and his marriage to a White Walker was part of the pact made between the First Men and the White Walkers. Several concessions were made between the First Men and the White Walkers, but the most important part was marriage. In order to ensure a lasting peace between these two warring people, a human man would be wed to a female White Walker. This human man being the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, or the Night's King. Eventually, he and his wife were killed by those who probably didn't believe that a lasting peace could ever be achieved. Those that were too ignorant to see the big picture, who could only see White Walkers as a threat and an enemy. A race of beings that need to be destroyed. The life and death of the Night's King is very similar to the life and death of Jon Snow. Jon Snow has always made an effort to see the potential in the people that he meets. Like when Samwell Tarly first arrives at Castle Black, Jon is the only one to defend the helpless boy. His protection of Sam is the main reason that Sam's intelligence doesn't go to waste. And now Sam is one of Jon's most important allies. Jon also plays the role of peacemaker between the Night's Watch and the Wildlings. When Jon is captured by the Wildlings, he learns that they are only considered enemies because they were born on the wrong side of the wall. Mance Raider, the king of the Free Folk, tells Jon that he never wanted a war with the Night's Watch, but he was willing to fight for the survival of his people. After being elected Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Jon attempts to make peace with the Wildlings in order to ensure the survival of both the Wildlings and the Night's Watch. He knows how unpopular this decision will be, but he also understands that the Wildlings cannot survive much longer north of the Wall. He'd much rather risk his life and popularity so that the Wildlings can fight alongside the Night's Watch when the White Walkers finally come. Really, John's greatest attribute is his objectivity. He can see the bigger picture when others are blind to it. He does not cling to his hatred, prejudice, or personal ambition. He what was I saying the whole damn time? What was I saying the whole damn time? At least, at least some of you guys on my channel understood why I like John so much. This is the exact way. I mean, this guy puts it, I mean, of course, you know that he wrote this down. You know what I'm saying? To repeat it to y'all, because this is not definitely not half off the top of his head. Um... But to put it in an intelligent way, he could not have said it any better. And this is what I repeatedly said about John: is his objectivity. Um, he sees the bigger picture, even though there was a couple of times when he wasn't thinking about the bigger picture. You get what I'm saying? But overall, overall, and don't get me wrong, I do believe that John makes dumb decisions. You know what I'm saying? I do believe that. But at the same time, I also believe that overall his character just sees the bigger picture. That's all he's been trying to tell people about is to just look at the bigger picture. Forget about yourself. Stop being so damn selfish. Forget about your hatred, who you hate at the time, who you who you even love at the time. You know what I'm saying? Just focus on the bigger picture. Crazy. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I, that's what one of the main things that I kept 
kept saying about John is that he focuses on the bigger picture, which is not what a lot of people see. They just see the Iron Throne and that's it. They believe that King's Landing is it. You conquer King's Landing, then we can go deal with whatever else is there. You know what I'm saying? So let's do it. Let's do it, man. He acts for the collective, not the individual. Yep. I'm not asking you to forget your dead. Mm. I'll never forget mine. Hey. I lost 50 brothers the night that Mance attacked the wall. But I'm asking you to think about your children now. They'll never have children of their own if we don't band together. The long night is coming. And the dead come with it. No clan can stop them. The free folk can't stop them. The Night's Watch can't stop them. And all the southern kings can't stop them. Only together. Speak the truth, us. man. And even then, it may not be enough. But at least we'll give the fuckers a fight. Mmm. Of course, his decision is seen as a betrayal by his men, and it ultimately cost him his life. It's very similar to the death of the Night's King. He was placed in an impossible situation. Keep the peace between enemies that have been fighting for years. Both the Night's King and John were killed by those too blinded by hatred to see the bigger picture. Fortunately for John, he was resurrected by Melisandre. And now that John is alive and well, he will be forced to play the same role again in Season 8. He will become the mediator between man and myth, between the living and the dead. Depending on who you ask in Westeros, different people will tell you different tales about the man who led the living against the dead during the first long night. The people in the north refer to him as the last hero, a man who took twelve companions north of the wall in search of the children of the forest. With the children's help, the last hero drove the walkers far into the northern regions. The wall was constructed shortly after. Followers of the Lord of Light, like Melisandre and Kinvara, refer to this legendary hero as Azor Ahai. Equipped with his magical sword Lightbringer, Azor Ahai led the living through the darkness and ushered in a new era. Once again, it's like a game of telephone. People of different countries, regions, families, and religions of the world of Game of Thrones all cling to their stories and myths. They cling to what they believe in. It's very much like real life. Nobody knows for sure, but most everyone believes in something. In reality, the last hero and Azor Ahai were probably the same person, with their individual legends being made up of truths and falsehoods. The last hero and Azor Ahai are just interpretations of the prophecy of the prince who was promised. The stories and myths are similar, and since Jon Snow is the prince who was promised, specific aspects of these legends may be repeated in Season 8. Our first point of interest here is the legend of Azor Ahai. Legend says that Azor Ahai wielded a magical sword named Lightbringer, and that he forged this magical weapon by plunging it into the heart of his wife, Nissa Nissa, with her soul combining with the steel. While I do believe that Azor Ahai and the last hero are the same person, I also believe that this legendary figure went on to become the Night's King, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who went on to make that one final sacrifice. When we take a closer look at the story of the last hero, it's said that he took 12 companions north of the wall, but he was the only one to survive. Maybe this is how his legend was mixed up with being considered the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He was the 13th hero. Assuming that Azor Ahai and the Night's King are the same person, the story of his wife Nissa Nissa has been misinterpreted. He never forged a magical sword named Lightbringer. The word Lightbringer is only a metaphor for his destiny. The prince that was promised will bring the dawn. He is the Lightbringer. The real reason why he plunged his sword into his wife's heart was to turn her into a White Walker. We know that Valyrian steel and dragonglass are the only two substances that can be used to kill a White Walker, but we also know that dragonglass can not only kill White Walkers, but it can also create them. In Season 6, Episode 5, The Door, Bran learns that the White Walkers were created by the Children of the Forest to protect themselves from the First Men. He witnesses the First Man that would become the First White Walker, and he watches as the Children of the Forest plunge a dragonglass dagger through his heart. What if instead of marrying a female White Walker, the Night's King transformed his human wife into a White Walker herself by using the same magic that the Children of the Forest used thousands of years ago? We've never actually seen a female White Walker in the books or the show, and it's believed that the only way for the White Walkers to procreate is through human sacrifices. This marriage between man and White Walker would keep the peace between these two warring enemies. 
The human sacrifices made by the Night's King would ensure the survival of the White Walker's race, and the marriage itself would ensure the security of the First Men. It's like any political marriage in Westeros, a union between two families that creates an alliance. In this case, it's a union between two different races that creates peace. This could be our answer to how Game of Thrones will finally end. The earlier seasons kept their focus on the literal Game of Thrones. Five families competing for a symbol of power, crushing all of those underneath them, all while ignoring the real threat up north. The political intrigue and subplots are not just a display of George R.R. R. Martin's genius and unpredictable writing, but they are used as a tool to show how deadly these games can become. The story's progression is found in the novel's titles. A storm of swords leaves a feast for crows. Thousands of people have died during the War of the Five Kings. Thousands more have had their lives destroyed. And in season five, Daenerys makes a proclamation to end this cycle of violence. Lannister, Targaryen, Baratheon, Stark, Tyrell. They're all just spokes on a wheel. This one's on top, then that one's on top, and on and on it spins, crushing those on the ground. It's a beautiful dream. Stopping the wheel. You're not the first person who's ever dreamt it. I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. Ironically, Daenerys' strategy to break the wheel is just doing more of the same. She has shown restraint, like when Jon and Tyrion convince her not to attack King's Landing, but her destructive tendencies are hard to ignore. Can Daenerys really break the wheel by doing more of the same? Even if Jon and Daenerys win the Great War in Season 8, then the anti-war message that they've stressed becomes inconsequential. Why put so much focus on diplomacy, understanding your enemy, and the moral complexities of war if the story is going to end with two armies slaughtering each other? It would be a familiar ending to an undeniably unique story. I'm all for cheating. This is war. But to slaughter them at a wedding, explain to me why it is more noble to kill 10,000 men in battle than a dozen at dinner. With the White Walkers finally breaking past the wall in Season 7, the choice to fight is an easy one. Wouldn't it make more sense if Game of Thrones ends with our heroes having to make a choice that isn't so black and white? If history does repeat itself, this choice will be in the hands of Jon Snow, and Daenerys might find herself on the wrong end of a dragon glass dagger. Like the Night's King during the first long night, John will decide to sacrifice Daenerys in order to end the Great War before it becomes a bloodbath. John and Bran will definitely reunite in Season 8, as will John and Sam, and through Bran's visions and knowledge of the past, and Sam's knowledge of ancient history, John will discover how this transformative magic works. He will then plunge a dragonglass dagger, possibly even his Valyrian steel sword Longclaw, into Daenerys' heart, transforming her into a White Walker. A marriage between Jon, a human man, and Daenerys, a female White Walker, would end the war without sacrificing thousands upon thousands of lives. Now Jon could make the decision to just straight up fight the Night King using Daenerys' army and her dragons, and they very well might win, but at what cost? Tens of thousands of people will die fighting this war. The Night King seemed to be toying with Jon and Daenerys in Season 7, luring them north only to easily kill one of their dragons. With only two dragons remaining, how many lives will it cost to defeat the Night King and his army? And just imagine this ending playing out, the reactions from the audience. You have these two characters that have been built up to be the heroes of this show, and their stories end in personal tragedy. Jon is forced to kill Daenerys, the one person who gives the living a chance to win this great war. Daenerys will become the symbol of hope in Season 8. The Dragon Queen, reborn from fire, the unburnt, the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, come to save the world from darkness, and then Jon stabs her in the heart. To the outside <laughs> world, he will look like a traitor, a man who betrayed his own race of beings, and in order to forge a peace between man and their enemies, only those closest to him will know the truth of his sacrifice. While John may be forced to make this decision in the books, the show may take a different route to the finish line. Daenerys has made several rash decisions throughout the series. She's impulsive, she's made plenty of deadly mistakes, and her detractors will scream Mad Queen until the end of time. But her goals seem clear. The relationship between John and Daenerys was slowly developed throughout Season 7, to a point of absolute trust between the two characters. Their ambitions are also the same, destroy the Night King and his army. Cinematically, the showrunners may choose the storybook ending over the holy shit my heart is broken into a million pieces ending. Not to say the ending sure. won't be bittersweet, but it will be less morally complex. There's still another way for Jon to kill Daenerys, albeit unintentionally, 
This other way is death by childbirth. Dying in childbirth was very common during medieval times, and it's also very common in Westeros. Several important characters that predate the events of the first season have died in childbirth. Lyanna Stark, Rhaella Targaryen, and Joanna Lannister, the three mothers to Jon, Daenerys, and Tyrion, respectively. All signs point to Daenerys and Jon having a child in Season 8. This scene in the Season 7 finale pretty much confirms it. Daenerys tells Jon that the witch who killed Khal Drogo told her that she would never be able to have kids again. I can't have children. Who told you that? The witch who murdered my husband. Has it occurred to you she might not have been a reliable source of information? Good old-fashioned D&D &D foreshadowing. This could be the bittersweet ending that George always talks about. Maybe this is how the books end as well. Daenerys dies in childbirth, and Jon dies fighting against the Night King. After Daenerys' death, Jon takes control of the remaining dragons, and both the Night King and the dragons are wiped out, thus ridding the world of both weapons of mass destruction. Maybe the child of Jon and Daenerys would go on to further the Targaryen line and rule over Westeros as king or queen. Well, there you have it, guys, and I just want to point out this is only a theory. I don't necessarily think this is how Season 8 is going to end, so make sure you comment and agree with me 100% because I know that's what <laughs> commenters on the internet do. I mean, have I ever been wrong about anything? Have I ever been once wrong about any of my predictions? Go watch all the videos, please. And once again, I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this. All right, so that was pretty awesome, to say the least. Um, I love the theory. I have to say I love the theory. Um, he definitely stayed within what was possible. And that's what that's what I love about these theories, man. They stay within what is possible. It makes you say, hmm, hmm. You know, that might, it makes you wonder. It makes you think about things from a different perspective. You know, um, according to what he was, what he explained, right? It is a possibility. It is a possibility that this could happen. I mean, I, my whole thinking has now changed to this being a possibility if they go for the oh my God, holy shit ending for season eight if this actually should happen. Not that we was, I mean, even though you see this theory, not not to, 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 to think that you're still not going to be expecting this to happen you still not gonna expect it i know i know um four months from now it's still if this happens you know it's still going to be a holy shit moment for me definitely gonna be a holy shit moment for me um more than likely because i'm still my mind is still not gonna be there you know what i'm saying but just to have this theory in mind is pretty awesome it is possible. I love how he explained it. Everything about it was good. I had to I had to get up and get my my lunch. So I'm going to have to edit this video, which is painful. <laughs> okay. Painful, you know. So shout outs to Nerd Soup, man. Great theory. Um great theory. I love that. Um I have a ton more to do today. The reason why I let I I I haven't done these um these in the past the reason why I haven't done these already um, was because they were long. They're all like 20 minutes long. So y'all going to have some long ass videos today. So thank you guys for tuning in once again. I love y'all, man. Stay tuned to the channel. There's more tributes to come dropping today. And also um, Peaky Blinders episode two. I want to drop that tonight or early tomorrow morning so i'm gonna try to get these out to you guys today so thank you guys for tuning in first time you're watching my reaction remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell also leave a like on this video um and comment on the video i love the interaction that you guys have on this channel man regardless of if you disagree or agree on certain things it's all welcomed here the debate is natural to be here okay just remember um, as I've always said, reaction is a part of life, man. We all got to deal with it. Okay, so thank you guys for tuning in once again. You already know who it is. It's your boy Terabyte Reacts, and peace.